All right, so today's topic, as Martha introduced, is the mechanical paradise. And uh, I want to open up the lecture by trying to give people a sense of the optimism and the sense of change that took place in the late 19th century. And then we're going to relate that a little bit to art. Just to do my, my housekeeping, I uh, want to remind you that this is going to be an ongoing series, as long as Martha and I can kind of keep this going, which might just be a couple of years, especially in the webinar format. But we're trying to do this on the first Monday of each month. It's a free, obviously a free session that you can sign up for at Winslow Art Center. And I also want to acknowledge that uh, this series really is inspired by teaching with a single textbook for over 31 years. Uh, for 31 years, I stayed with Shock of the New by Robert Hughes. When the publishers start making, stopped making new copies, I told my students, buy the used copy and get a bargain. And hopefully most of you know that if you do want to hear Robert Hughes present on this topic, uh, there are free videos available at ubu.com and many of them on YouTube. And the book version is still out there, inexpensive and widely available, and still a great, great and challenging book. So that said, I've adjusted this a little bit to the way that I say things after teaching it so many years, but I still open with a quote that Robert Hughes uh, has at the opening of, of his book, written in 1913 by a French writer. This writer said, the world has changed less since the time of Christ than it has in the last 30 years. So he would have been referring to the 1880s onward. And that's worth contemplating. And I think it's also worth saying that, uh, I think I can safely say that all of us are very, very accustomed to the idea of rapid changes and evolutions in technology. It's just been a part of our lives, all of our lives, but really things got going very, very quickly in the middle of the 19th century. So artists, you know, were paying attention like everyone else was to the changes. And uh, you begin to see in the middle of the 19th century, artists trying to express something about modernity and what it felt like. And the British artist Turner very famously used to stick his head out the window of train cars, you know, just to feel the, uh, the weather going by, kind of, kind of dangerous, but exhilarating. And in this 1844 painting, he tried to paint the experience or the, the sensation of a steam train coming across a bridge over the Thames. And you can see it's full of weather. It's an atmospheric romantic painting, but it's also a painting about technology. And when you think about it, this steam train was probably going, you know, about the same speed that you drive when you go to Target uh, in the afternoon to uh, get your groceries or buy a few things. So it's a speed that would not thrill or, uh, you know, make us anxious. It's a very ordinary speed, but it was extraordinary in 1844. The reality of uh, you know, what was the world like earlier, let's say at the beginning of the 19th century, I think I'm going to put it in one painting. I'm going to use Corbet Stonebreakers. And let's recognize for a moment that uh, civilization was built by human labor uh, with the help of some draft animals uh, you know, that kicked in, literally. But uh, in this realist painting by Corbet, we need to be reminded of what, what work was before the advent of factories and before we had kind of the, the mechanical slaves that uh, came along and began to produce things for us. It's interesting to note that the advent of modernism really, in art especially, coincides with the abolition of slavery in the United States, because you can feel not only is culture changing, but the source of labor is beginning to change. And uh, the steam plow came along in the 1860s, along with modernism. So that's something to think about. It would be uh, bad PowerPointing, <laughs> you know, to read this entire list of things that came along in the 19th century. So I'll, I'll you know, glance at it with you and maybe point out a few. But this is just to give you a, a feeling for how many things that are now commonplace and, and so well developed in our era were absolutely new in the 19th century. Uh, there are certainly some ominous ones like the machine gun, and there are certainly some that relate to the visual world, like uh, x-rays, the movie camera, of course, photography. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about photography because I think the process by which images became mechanical 
has a real parallel with the fact that uh, these innovations happened in France, where the tradition of the painted image had been so strong. It's almost like for a period like painting and photography were kind of developing hand in hand, uh, you know, uh, art and, and technology moving towards some of the same things. That is a reproduction of the first known photograph from 1826. And if it looks grainy, if you can barely make out the architecture or the trees in the distance, that's partly because it's an eight hour exposure. So anything that even quivered or moved, you know, would have gone out of focus. And that's why only architecture could be photographed. But that is really a momentous uh, image in human history. The first true reproduction and mechanization of the image of the world. And then in 1839, Louis Daguerre, who would develop the daguerreotype, a popular form of uh, photography, uh, actually recorded the first human being in a photo. And I'll let you scan for a minute and see if you can see the, the human being. There's actually two, but one of them is partial. This was an exposure that probably took eight to 10 minutes. So there were very likely people walking down the street in this photograph, but they were blurred by the process. However, there is a man getting his shoe shined and you can see him because he must have been reasonably still or, or fairly in the same place during the exposure and the shoe shine man was moving. So he turned into kind of a, uh, a shadowy robot in the photo. But 1839, the first human being depicted by a photograph. And then by the 1850s, by the middle of the 19th century, the photograph began to be a mass item, maybe something you could get done at uh, county fairs. It began to influence uh, artists, visual artists. Uh, it became commonplace. And uh, it started moving toward the era that we live in, where I don't know what you have on your iPhone, but I take 20 photos a day on a slow day. <laughs> you know, photography has become so developed and so commonplace but all of this is rooted in the early to mid 19th century. I'm gonna use this short video, if I can get it to play, to just take a minute and a half and take you back to try and use your imagination and ask yourself, what did it really feel like to contemplate the idea? that was modernity in, in one film. And uh, of course, it's worth pointing out, the movie camera that recorded that had been invented 18 years earlier. So, uh, all right, now that we maybe have that, that feeling of what was it part like to be a spectator of the unfolding of modernism, let's talk about the way that art and modernity kind of collided, uh, tried to understand each other. Uh, there is a monument outside of Paris to a man named Levisor who won an important road race at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. 
and his car probably topped out under 20 miles an hour. But you can see he was given a traditional French monument. He was given an arch along with some classical columns and carved in a relief, you know, coming across the finish line. And it's a weird piece of art because it shows you how backwards, or I guess how rooted in the past, the idea of a monument was. And it didn't quite have a comfortable way to depict a, a petroleum powered car. So I think the way I wanna frame the next part of the lecture is to say that the, the problem that visual artists had really was not how to depict the machine. I mean, you could carve one out of stone, you, you could paint one, you could photograph one. But I think the problem that artists really began to work with was what is changing about the experience of seeing in the modern world? Uh, how are people gonna see differently? Uh, how do you depict that change in seeing? It really comes down to finding a way that art can reflect the experience of modernity. And that's gonna be the key question for the, the rest of my lecture. I will say, if you, uh, you know, wanted to show people what a, a modern steamship looked like at the turn of the century, probably the most dependable way was to use illustration, like this poster, you know, just show it for what it is. But artists have different aims. When the Eiffel Tower was built for the uh, 1888 World's Fair, one of the things that Robert Hughes says about it is that it became a pivot in human consciousness. And in fact, he makes the analogy. He said that when people would get to the top of the Eiffel Tower during the World's Fair and look down at the city, and see it from above, they were having an experience a little bit like we all had when we saw the moon with Neil Armstrong stepping out in the, uh, in the 1960s. We had a kind of a point of view that had not been experienced before, uh, in, in this case, except for maybe a few people in, in balloons. So the Eiffel Tower, when it was finished, was the, uh, the tallest man-made structure in the world. And you can see that it used a very modern material. It used metal rather than using stone like the Levisor monument. And along with it, along with the experience that it provided and then the contemplation that came afterwards, there were changes in the way that things were shown. And uh, Blurio was an aviator in France who followed the uh, Wright brothers and concocted his own, own monoplane, which was eventually hung in a cathedral in Paris, like, a, like an archangel up on the ceiling. And the style, that came out of Paris, which of course will be the topic of, of my next lecture was Cubism. And Cubism offered you a feeling of what was it like to move around something and see it from different angles all at once, rather like the way that Blurio would have flown around the tower and seen it from every angle in, in you know, different directions. And you can see a little Cubist fragment of Blurio's monoplane in this 1911 picture by Delaunay. Well, the father or the grandfather of this idea, of this new way of seeing, was really someone rather unlikely because he was not a scientist and, and not particularly interested in technology. But the most original new way of seeing came from a painter named Paul Cezanne. I love this Cezanne quote, and I struggled a little bit to find an image to go with it, but uh, Cezanne once said, we live in a rainbow of chaos. And uh, that's the kind of thing I think only a painter would say. It's a really, really brilliant uh, saying. And I found this uh, oil painting from 1880. And as I looked at it, I realized that in the background, you see the new city of Paris that was being erected in the 1870s by Baron Hausmann, the great uh, city planner. And you see the wealthy in their top hats and their carriages with their umbrellas. You see the, the life of the bourgeois class of that new growing city. But in the foreground, in the marketplace, you see the people from the countryside who are still living the agrarian life, you know, coming into the city to sell their goods. So I think to me, this was the rainbow of chaos, the coming together of different ways of living in the collisions of the, uh, the cultural collisions of the modern city. So a little bit of text before I get back to images, but this helps me give you some themes, give you some things to think about when the presentation is over. Uh, the speed at which people were seeing things began to change. You took a train ride or later 
if you were in a Model T in the 1920s, you were seeing the world faster than people had seen it before. They'd seen it on foot or on horseback. So the, the, the speed of seeing was changing. As I mentioned before, for people uh, at the heart of this lecture, because we're gonna use Paris as the heart of modernism, the view from the Eiffel Tower uh, gave people a view of the city as pattern and they could see you know, whole districts and people the size of, of ants. And that was a new experience. It was a new kind of a consciousness. Photography was complicated because it was mechanical. And at first it seemed like it was competition for painters. Then it became source material for painters, like a form of drawing, but it was unemotional. It was mechanical. It had a different set of, of very objective possibilities and art isn't necessarily objective. And finally, painters didn't just want to change the, the subject matter of painting. You know, they didn't necessarily want to paint steam trains or, uh, or ocean liners or airplanes, but they wanted to change how it was seen and how it was painted. So how does Cezanne fit into this? How, how did he approach all of this? One thing he did is something that Monet had done particularly before him. He would take the same motif and paint it over and over again, but see it a little bit differently every time. And that emphasized the process of seeing rather than the subject matter. You know, the subject matter is there, look at it from a different angle, see it again and again, maybe like a, <laughs> a blurio flying over and uh, see how it changes every time. He also was an emotional person. He acknowledged that he was maybe perceiving as much as he was seeing. So he painted what he felt about what he saw. And that's very, very critical to the way that his art developed. And finally, I'm gonna use this word process a lot. He, he valued the process of seeing and painting, those two processes, much more than he valued the finished result. And there's some great stories about uh, Cezanne. One of them was that when a dealer, I think a dealer and a critic came to see him late in his career, they saw a painting of his stuck in the tree branches outside his bedroom because he'd just gotten tired of this painting and, and tossed it out there. And there's a lot of stories about Cezanne taking a knife to paintings or destroying them or being very dissatisfied because he wasn't so much about the finished painting. He was much more about trying to get to the finished painting and struggle is a visible part of his work. So when you look at early Cezanne, or I'll personalize that, when I look at early Cezanne, I don't see a genius. I see a man who's training himself to paint who is really struggling. And there are some uncomfortable psychological themes in early Cezanne, uh, you know, kind of a, an abduction, maybe a rape fantasy, a bit of classicism, a bit of romanticism, and paint that's put, put on like baked macaroni and very heavy impasto paint. So he, you know, you can see he maybe wants to be part of this grand French tradition, but he's not of it. He doesn't have the, the skill. And uh, he's got a whole new kind of naive relationship to the tradition of art. Um, let's simplify that. He was not an academic painter. He was not a painting who desired or submitted to academic training. Uh, he was really uh, kind of under the thumb of his father. His father was a banker with some money. So I think in his early years, we probably would have called Cezanne a, a failure to launch. And that changed when his father died and he inherited the bank. Then he was really able to do what he wanted. But here's his father, you know, on the verge of being a modern man, reading the, you know, the newspaper uh, with lithographed cartoons, sitting there in his big uh, fatherly chair, painted bluntly and respectfully by his son who is struggling to find a way to paint. And for me, Cezanne begins to become himself. He begins to become Cezanne with his bather paintings, with this kind of series of figure paintings. And they remain awkward and heavily brushed and very, very blunt paintings. However, and the however it is a big thing, you also begin to see that he has found his own way of doing things that he's going to build on. He, he's made a foundation for his art. So for example, the use of a flat brush held in a way that it goes slightly at a diagonal. That's Cezanne. 
um, using paint without transparent layers or glazes to add subtlety at the end, just working with raw oil paint right out of the tube. And by the way, tube paints were a late 19th century invention that, that painters like uh, Van Gogh or Cezanne took advantage of. And then finally, this idea that he wasn't really interested in, uh, let's say, mythology or history or classicism, he really used the figure as what I would call a vehicle, an expressive vehicle, whether he painted men or whether he painted women, he had a feeling about them and he wanted to paint how he felt about them. And it didn't have to be photographic. It didn't have to be refined like the way that an academic painter would want to show you the world in that way. It had to have a sense of how he felt about it. And he said, he put this very explicitly into words, and you can see it here with his drawing style, a work of art which did not begin in emotion is not art. And you can see here in drawing his wife, it's not a firm drawing. It's not a drawing, again, that, that maybe tries to compete in any way with illusionistic ph photography. It's a repeated, rather obsessive drawing where he repeats the lines as many times as he needs in the center or lets them fade away at the edges because he is having this kind of contemplation, almost a meditation on the features of his wife and trying to comprehend, comprehend her and comprehend how he feels about her. So this is a famous Cezanne bather that is in uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And if you listen to my Diebenkorn webinar, uh, you're gonna recognize a few things I have to say about this, but it really is a kind of a, a turning point in Cezanne's art. It's a simple painting. It's a young man in a bathing suit leaning towards us. He's got that kind of contrapposto pose that a, a classical Apollo might have. But where it gets interesting is when you consider the fact that Cezanne did use a photographic model for this painting. So he was beginning to use photography as a reference, maybe as a form of drawing. And you might ask yourself, if he used a photograph, why doesn't his painting look more like a photograph? Why does it look so insistently painted? Well, I think the answer has to be that Cezanne wanted to add his own perception and his own emotional response and his own indecision to that image. So very famously, around the edges of the legs of that bather, you see where he moved the outlines. You know, moved one leg an inch this way, the other one an inch that way. And he actually broke up the continuity of the background with this kind of gray scumble around the edges. So it tells you what mattered to Cezanne was being able to make his own decisions about a form in space or about an image. And he didn't mind at all that when you stepped into a gallery years later, you'd say, that looks unfinished or that looks unrefined, or that looks like he changed his mind. Not only would those things not bother him, I think he would probably tell you, well, that's part of the painting, you know, my, my sense of decision. And fast forward to now, I wanna mention something I like to mention, and then we'll go back to, to modernism. But I love what the painter uh, Vincent Desiderio says about something he calls the technical narrative. He says that part of the subject matter of a painting is the artist's effort to make that painting. Let that hang there for a moment. The artist's effort to make the painting is part of the subject of the painting. So this isn't just a bather. The bather is a vehicle. It's also a painting that tells you about how Cezanne's process and his mind were working. And look at this contrast. Probably the, the richest painter in Paris during this whole era, and later the teacher of, of Matisse, was Bouguereau. Uh, Bouguereau, was, there's a famous quote, by the way, he was so wealthy, he once told someone he bragged, he said every time he goes to the bathroom to piss, he lost 10 francs because he was so productive and, and you know, the paintings were selling so well when new, very few people knew who Cezanne was. But look at the difference in approaches with the same subject matter. Bouguereau is using photography as a reference and he's going for a photographic effect. Every fold in that gown. Uh, every detail of the tones on the skin, every bit of hair that comes off the edge of her silhouette. And when you look at Madame Cezanne, Madame Cezanne is painted, I'm going to say rather impartially. 
uh, painted as a kind of an experiment in painting. Uh, her dress is blotchy and unfinished, and the setting is uh, tilted. And her expression, it looks like she maybe changed her expression while she was painting, and Cezanne went with that. He let one eyebrow be very high, you know, John Belushi style, and he left the other one low. It's not a flattering painting. But again, it reflects Cezanne's process as an artist rather than the goal of uh, academic representation. So you can visit Cezanne's uh, studio now, the wonderful tourist attraction. And I understand they have some fellowships. There's some artists that have, have lived and, and worked there, but you can kind of get into his world and see a lot of the objects that he painted uh, time and, and time again. And when he was in uh, this studio, he certainly did a lot of work with still life. And still life allowed him to uh, work with material that could be constantly arranged or rearranged. It's almost as if an awful lot of what you and I would think of as the painting actually happened on the table, right? This orange goes here, that lemon goes there. Let's fold the tablecloth. He could control the lighting. So he got tremendous control over his subject matter. And letting, you know, being able to have so much control over his subject matter actually let him be, I think, a little more free in the way he painted it. So I want to make this point with a photo from Cezanne's studio. That's a photograph on the left and a Cezanne painting. Sorry, I got that backwards. Cezanne painting on the left, photograph of his studio on the right. But Cezanne's work always asserted that it was painted, even when his work is rather refined and rather full of color and carefully shaded as that still life is, I think in an instant, you'd still say, well, that's, that's a painting. <laughs> it asserts itself as a human product. Wonderful quote from Cezanne, gives you a key to you know, a specific amb ambition he had. He said, with an apple, I will astonish Paris. And I have to tell you, as somebody that taught art for a lot of years, when we had student shows, usually, the paintings that would really get the attentions of, of students' families were the paintings that you and I would call hyper-realist, that really looked like a photograph, that were very, very refined, that uh, you know, were eye-poppingly uh, detailed. Those kinds of things easily get our attention. Well, what Cezanne was trying to do, I mean, when you look at this apple, it's something much, much different. You know, his sense of astonishment was going to come from his own wonder, of struggle, of the doubts he had about what he was seeing, and with every tentative brushstroke and hint of color, and even with the naked paper, he was kind of asking a question: Is this what I see? You know, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to see it. Uh, one of the things we have associated with Cezanne, I think he said it, but I think critics said it too. Uh, it was said that every brushstroke in Cezanne had a petite sensation, a little touch a little bit of emotion. So to put it another way, he felt it. And if you want to uh, fast forward that to now, I hear an awful lot of people talking about mindfulness as it relates to uh, Eastern thought. And I have no trouble saying to you that I think Cezanne was mindful about his uh, painting. I think the consciousness of painting was very, very important to him. So when you see this lovely still life with uh, cherries and peaches, Hopefully when it came across the street screen, you just felt delighted. You know, this man who painted the very, very awkward figure paintings at the beginning of his career, painted his father with the newspaper, is now making what we could agree is some really lovely work with bold post-impressionist uh, colors. It's things we could recognize. It's things we'd like to see on a table <laughs> at a uh, get together. However, the longer you look, you are gonna pick up some disconcerting uh, facts. For example, I'll put a blue line across there. Follow that blue line from the left edge across to the right through the pitcher or through the jug and look what happens. The back of the table has dropped. So what's possible here? Is this a very, very badly carpentered table or did someone saw it in half under the pitcher and kind of, you know, skew it? Uh, while Cezanne was painting it? Well, I think the answer is that Cezanne gave you multiple perspectives. I mean, it's subtle, but he actually shows you the table 
almost as if you were at one level looking at the left side, and then maybe you changed your point of view a little bit on the other side. He's letting you kind of walk around the objects in this painting. And not just that, let's add something else. Uh, when you look at the, the plate of cherries or the, the bowl of cherries, whatever you want to call it, I've put an ellipse in front of it. Can you see how dramatically he tilted that? He tilted it because I guess he wanted to, <laughs> very willful. He maybe wanted to show you what was in that bowl and didn't care so much that gravity might carry the, you know, the cherries out the bottom of it. Here's another painting where something similar happens. And isn't it interesting that parts of this painting get very, very abstract? He is very, very clear about the fruit because he wants to take your eyes there as focal points, but the rest of it begins to blur. But let's look what happens. The left edge of the table does not cross to the right. So again, we've got that kind of lowered table edge, that kind of double vision. And once again, we have fruit that might really, in truth, just fall off the plate and go onto the floor because he has turned that plate upwards towards us. So it's almost as if he's saying, walk into my studio and look over the still life. And by the way, if you want, you can hover right over the fruit <laughs> because that's what you're really going to want a piece of. Maybe that's how he's going to astonish you with an apple is not how he paints it, but the point of view he gives you of it or the way he lets you feel like you are approaching it from multiple points of view. A great kind of complaint or an observation about Cezanne's work was that late in his career, it looks very, very unfinished. And I think Cezanne's reply to that would be, I took it as far as I could. <laughs> you know, every painting was a group of problems to be solved. He would go to a certain point and just say, that's where the painting took me. I put that against the wall and I worked on something else. And that whole subjective question of when is a painting finished began to blossom as a serious question in the history of modern art. And finally, let's talk about Cezanne working in series uh, from this fantastic uh, house that he had after his father died, after he was a, uh, an heir. Uh, he had a view of this mountain in this valley, Mont Saint-Victoire. And with a, a backpack and a folding easel, which by the way, we now call him a, a French easel. I have one from Dick Blick, but the French easel, he would be a plain air painter and go out near his home and paint uh, Mont Saint-Victoire. And every single painting is different. And the ways in which the paintings differ uh, are greatly varied. Some like this are rather, uh, how do I say, flatly planar with heavy scumbles of paint and firm outlines, subdued colors. And then you kind of rise up that mountain into warm tones against the cool sky. And there's visible brushwork in that sky. You don't so much say, I can see what the clouds looked like that day. You more tend to say, you know, I could see how he applied his brushwork. And you may also want to notice that some of the architecture, the architecture close to us, is becoming very, very carefully sculpted to emphasize the three dimensional forms. And this is a period when Cezanne was trying to reduce every form in nature to the sphere, the cone, or the cube because he thought that simplifying and emphasizing forms was gonna be another way that he could take people through his perceptions as he painted. Another view of the same mountain, maybe you know, hiked around the edge a little bit more. He's closer to it. He's let one edge of the canvas remain uh, raw. He tells you less about the rocks, but he obviously values it as a painting different format of canvas, a vertical canvas. Look at the peak of Mont Saint-Victoire, which, you know, if you want to giggle, does it look a little bit like a breast? Maybe it does. But the thing that I notice is that he really gives the mountain two outlines. It's as if he painted it and then said, you know, I think it was over here a few minutes ago, but then he left it. So you have this kind of ghost, you have this kind of halo of the image as if to say, I'm not going to give you a decisive image. Decisive imagery is for photographs and for cameras. That's for mechanical reproduction. Closer still with these kind of almost prismatic applica applications of color. Um, you don't see individual leaves in the trees. You see uh, prismatic fragments. You see blunt diagonal brushstrokes in the trees. So you get the form of the tree, 
but not the detail. That doesn't interest him and he's, he's too busy and doing other things to give you one leaf after another. A framing device, standing under a pine and letting that somehow rhyme with the top of the mountain. And you can see how the branches very conveniently curl into the, uh, the space between the two, uh, the two rising shapes in the background. You know, the wonderful thing about painting this way, which I, I figure is the way that most of you paint, is you're never done. You never run out of things to do. You know, you can always walk outside and paint the mountain because it's different at every moment. I think that's a watercolor where he let transparency be part of his process. So there's a lot we can give Cezanne credit for. But I would say art historically and in the history of modernism, a very significant thing is that uh, he died in 1906. And it was either the year that he died or the year after, it was 06 or 07, he had a major retrospective in Paris. And Picasso saw it. And George Brock saw it. And uh, they really took from Cezanne's painting, especially from his uh, broken forms. And that gave them a lot of the ideas that they needed to develop Cubism. So if you want to call Cezanne the grandfather of, of Cubism, I think that is a very, very apt title for him. I also want to say one more thing about the theme of today's lecture. I want to give us all kind of a, uh, a yin to that yang. Of course, there was great optimism and great stimulation that came from modern technology and modern inventions. But you want to remember that by uh, World War I, by the second decade of the, of the 20th century, the mechanical paradise got replaced by something else. It got replaced by the mechanical hellscape. And the inventions of the early you know, 19th century and, and you know, before the war played into the terror and the absolute loss and horror of that war. So there was this kind of brief radiant period, late 19th century, early 20th century, where there was a very great optimism about progress and technology. And then that was soberingly uh, turned around uh, after not too long. All right, so just a kind of a, you know, wrapping that up, I want to remind you that we're going to try and do these uh, once a week. And Martha gave me an ad, but I'll, I'll add uh, a little advertisement as well. We'll have a nice connection when we're here on uh, March 7th, because I'll talk about Picasso and Cubism. We'll go from Cezanne to Picasso, and we'll talk about how Cubism became, uh, what's the best way to put it? It, it, was, the, it was the must do style for modernists for another uh, 10 or 20 years. Any serious painter that wanted to call themselves modern had to try Cubism because it offered such a remarkable and fresh way of transmitting the modern uh, experience.